I was uh, born in uh, Austin, Texas on uh, January 21st, 1929. I was born at a hospital there, which was called the Breckenridge Hospital. I was the uh, only child in the family who, had, who went to college. And my father was an electrician, and my mother was a homemaker, and she was very active in, uh, in uh, school things. And uh, that, that uh, we had a nice, peaceful family. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure my father would agree with that, although he's dead. Uh, I'm sure he didn't think I was very peaceful. And uh, he probably thought I was just a troublemaker. Well, my dad had a temper, but it was no, no greater or smaller than my temper. He had, he had a temper, but it wasn't a danger temper. It was just a, I'll spank you temper. My mother uh, also uh, it was very uh, firm with me. One time I said to her, I was mad, and I said, what I'm going to do, mother, is I'm going to leave here and run away from home. And my mother said, when can I help you pack? <laughs> I, I was a pretty good student. The, the teachers thought I was pretty nice. And uh, they liked me especially because I always brought them an apple a day. I remember you said once you wanted to be a minister. <laughs> oh, well, that Probably it was something said with something a glass of some kind in my hand at the time. But, so, uh, no, I, I, I did not uh, necessarily ever want to be a minister, but I was very interested in religion uh, when I was younger and then going to school, and particularly even more, more interested when I was maybe 12 or 13. Uh, uh, Revivals would come into town and we'd go to the revivals and people would get baptized and people would get bathed and people had to walk up the aisle who wanted to be saved and so forth and so on. So I, that sounded like pretty exciting to a 12 or 13 year old kid and so I, that probably where my mother got that idea that I was wanted to be a minister. Um, probably would count as time in certain grade but uh, not important to what I did later on. Then also I was in grade school, and I got up to, until uh, um, high school. Uh, I uh, was a very good student in high school, had good grades, and uh, graduated uh, actually when I was 16 years old, uh, which put me about one, one uh, year or two years ahead of, the, ahead of my classmates. And, uh, uh, but also made it awkward for me because in getting out that early, I had to skip some classes in school or modify the classes. And one, one uh, that I skipped, which has uh, bothered me for many years, is that I had to take second year algebra rather than first year algebra. And it was a real struggle to, to get through and even get a good, I got a passing grade, but it took a lot of work. As a matter of fact, I was the uh, first person in my family to go to the uh, to college education. My uh, mother and father uh, really uh, really made an effort to, to see that I got got to college. That uh, uh, was one reason I was able to graduate at, at 16. And uh, they, they, as a matter of fact, that uh, sort of got into the family budget, sending me to the college, although it was a free college since it was the University of Texas in Austin, and that's where I enrolled for my, uh, my first year. Well, I went, I went from high school uh, directly into the college at the University of Texas, and uh, my parents were financing that bill, the money at that time. And the, uh, I uh, did not have a very successful college career, uh, which happened, turned out, out really, uh, was because I wanted to become an electrical engineer. And uh, I found out electrical engineering uh, was a difficult subject, uh, particularly it included chemistry. 
and I didn't do very well in chemistry either in high school or, or college. And uh, that's what led me from there uh, to go into some other major because I knew I wasn't going to do as much as a major because like, although I liked engineering, it didn't like me very much. I then decided that with the GI Bill coming up and going to expire in about 45 days, that I better enlist in the service. The GI Bill was a, a bill to it encourage people to go to college and to pay a part of their tuition. And uh, it amounted to $50 a month and for the, uh, for the uh, classwork, and it amounted to the cost of the books with a limit of, I think, $50 or something on the whole thing. So at, at the end, uh, uh, what you got from the federal government was this uh, educational money, uh, which I took uh, quite a bit of that advantage of, and uh, went into the Air Force when I was 17. I had to go to uh, San Antonio, which was about 75 miles from Austin, and my parents drove me down to the to the uh, office where you got got, in, got sworn in. Well, there I had to take a uh, intelligence test, and I took a, I did so, and uh, it was uh, with a much better result than I was getting at the University of Texas chemistry class, because I got something which was. Oh, you know, people go around saying, God, this guy got here, I got this score here, that's awfully high, you know. He sure he's dead. he sure he doesn't cheat. No, he wouldn't cheat. I kept my eye on him all the time. So I said, okay. And so then they, they, they uh, took me and took uh, the, that uh, test uh, as sort of a guidepost and decided that they would, they would send me. They, they said, we're going to get they, they tried to give me a choice between uh, uh, going to radar school or going to the intelligence branch. And I took the, the radar school and I went from uh, sworn in there and I was then sent to Boca Raton, Florida. And uh, I spent most of my, a lot of my career there in, in Boca Raton. Uh, I have a, a significant remember about Boca Raton because it was there, uh, we were living in, in cardboard boxes, and it was there that they had a big a hurricane and everything, everybody was scrambling around to find some way to hide or get out of it. Uh, from there, I uh, got sent to uh, Spokane, Washington, uh, where I uh, it was in the radar service there, uh, which incidentally was called ground control approach. It was a radar which enabled airplanes to land in the, in the fog and a uh, very important branch of the service and uh, very, very good job. Uh, from there, I went to, uh, was transferred to McCord Air Force Base in uh, Washington to be a teacher, and when that was done, they sent me back to, to uh, Spokane. I didn't have any armed service, and I finally got discharged and given my uh, 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 bonus, which was not very much, but uh, in any event, it was about you know a hundred dollars or something. And I think I think I, that they gave me a train ticket, but I'm not sure. And I, through my brilliance, I was discharged as a buck sergeant. That means I had three stripes. And uh, all, everybody else who went to the GI Bill about that same period of time came out as captains or lieutenants and so forth. And I don't know why I got, got to the, the, uh, the, uh, the stock. It didn't, it didn't bother me at that time, but it was kind of interesting that uh, the guy I was having breakfast with was going in as a, uh, being discharged as a captain, and I was going, <laughs> being discharged as a sergeant. So that that's about sums up my whole military career and my, a lot of my life. 
when I was discharged, I, uh, I came down to uh, Los Angeles, and uh, there was a company in Los Angeles named Gilfill and Brothers, and Gilfill and Brothers managed these, uh, are built and sold the, this radar equipment. And so I went out to them and said, I've had, had this training in the Air Force, and et cetera. Uh, and they said, in effect, good, we will hire you to be a radar technician. And I did that. And I, they, I, I got um, I employed as a radar engineer, actually, and uh, which was interesting because being a radar engineer uh, was the, probably the equivalent of a field grade uh, legal officer or law officer. Uh, and the field grade means I got the same privileges and had the same privileges as did a major. Uh, so that that was uh, turned out pretty good, and I went from uh, I went from uh, Los Angeles. I got hired. You know, and I think I spent a little while up at Riverside, going to a further law school, a further course, and from there, I got orders to go to uh, Okinawa, and I did go to Okinawa, and I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Okinawa, but it must have been a 17th birthday, 18th birthday, 19th birthday. Something like that would be my would be my guess. Okinawa was right in the front lines, uh, heavily bombed by the Japanese, heavily bombed by uh, by like by us. Uh, a lot of airplanes, a lot of ships were uh, sunk right out in off of Okinawa, uh, where they were either bombed by the Japanese or they were uh, did something to them so that they disabled them and then so. There, there. Uh, you, you would look on one side of the island, and you would look out, and down below was a bay, and the bay was just covered uh, with these ships, warships, so forth. So the war was over then. The Okinawa, uh, generally speaking, was a very nice place. The Okinawan people, who were Japanese, uh, were very nice to to me and uh, to the to the military in general, and uh, it was very nice. As you probably know, it was during this same period of time, roughly approximately time, I can't be sure about the dates, uh, that I met uh, my wife, Mary Dean. And Mary Dean was, had a very important position with Okinawa. She was the senior, or she was the director, or whatever they call them, uh, of the uh, entire civilian workforce on Okinawa. And the civilian workforce was quite large, and so she had she had that job, and so she was she was a very important person. I heard you met at a card game. Met Did you met Mary Dean at a card game, and you impressed her? That's a, just a nasty rumor. Well, what happened is is that I, I did meet her at a card game, uh, Hearts. We were playing Hearts. Uh, the, the officer I was reporting, the officer, military officer I had to report to, was a, a, a lieutenant whose name was Alfred Butt, I think it was, and uh, he had a uh, girlfriend, and the girlfriend was living at the same Qantas hut which uh, Mary Dean was. And so I was over. I was there to date Mary Dean, and he was there to date his girlfriend, and. Uh, there was another guy who was there who thought he was dating Mary Dean that day. And uh, so we ended up, uh, finally, somebody said, this is kind of boring, why don't we play hearts? So we got the pair paired up and got uh, uh, properly matched and had a game. And uh, for some reason or other in this game, cards kept, kept slipping out of my hand. And uh, they would slip out and go down. and. Generally, that was something which was very helpful to my hand and not so helpful to the others. And um, after a while, the other the other person there that was for Mary Dean began to get a little upset with me about being so slick as a card person. But that's about of it. We didn't get to come to blows or anything. So he said he left he left that party still thinking he was dating Mary Dean, and I could sense I was going to be the one that the next continued dating Mary Dean. So. Oh, my impressions of Mary Dean was she was a pretty good, good-looking girl. <laughs> and 
and uh, smart, far smarter than me. And uh, it's very nice that she knew all of the military brass and and uh, had a good rank and good standing and that's so all. So those are generally my impression. Uh, is that if you can marry her, you better get after her, get going. <laughs> so. so it was love at first sight, huh? Uh, for me, not for her, I think. But it was for me, it was love at first sight. And so you had to uh, pursue her, huh? You had to woo her? <laughs> well, if you, you know, had dated, I mean, it's what you call wooing somebody, I guess so. But um, we, we, we dated, and we finally became a couple that had dating, and, and uh, that was the way it was. Oh, we got married in uh, uh, Manila, and... Uh, I'm not sure what the date was, but it was, it was about 60 years, 65 years, or something like that. And uh, at that time, I had received orders from the Gilfillan brothers to go to Japan. At the same time, Mary Dean received orders that she was to go uh, home. And so it just so, so came in that she went directly from Okinawa, not directly, she toured the world. From Okinawa, she went. She went to Egypt, and she went to China, and she went to lots of other places. Then, after that, we both we both got we got married. She came back and spent her home her time at home with her parents, who lived in South Pasadena. And I came out at the time and lived with the family. Then from that point on, uh, it became a, a rat race uh, to finish college, get into law school and so forth. Finishing, finishing a, a college, uh, I had a limited number of hours available to me under the GI Bill. So I, I figured out, well now if I if I do such and such, then I can extend it over into going to law school, and then I could get both the law school paid and the and the University of Texas paid uh, with the with the uh, uh, with the, uh, the proceeds from the GI Bill. I uh, loaded up and went, took the maximum number of courses that I could do, do which I think at that time was 20 hours, and uh, I worked to got. I worked at, on grades and so forth at, uh, for the 20 hours. And then uh, the summer came along, and I took the maximum class hours under the, the summer, summer program, which I think at the time were about 19 or something. But in any event, I, I think I didn't get a written award, but I got a compliment about how I was probably took more courses during certain period than anybody else did. And that, that led to my getting my degree uh, earlier, I think, in two years rather than four. I finished my undergraduate program at the University of Texas, and I finished, uh, uh, majored in a, a business, a business uh, uh, school graduate. Before I left the University of Texas, I got my, my complete grade history of all what my grades were, where I stood in the class, and what I'd done, and so forth. And uh, they, they were marked differences in these two, uh, two, two grade sheets, because one, the one at, when I first went to the University of Texas when I was young, and it's what prompted me to go to the Air Force, was not very many A's, or even B's, or C's. So they were really very, very poor. But once I got out and went to the University of Texas, then I made a, a pretty good set of, of, of grades. About all A's. I think I had uh, one uh, B plus in some weird subject matter, which caused, caused me to go call, to call upon the professor who decided to uh, be so nervous to give me a, a B plus, and we we went around and talked a lot about it, and I couldn't make him change his mind, so I had all A's, except this one B plus. 
somewhere in that period of time, um, Louise was born. Louise was my daughter. Louise was really crying hard. She was a baby, you know. And she was uh, really crying and making a lot of noise. And some the telephone rang, and some guy called her and the said, I wish you would do something with the straight goddamn child. Shut up. Nobody can get any sleep around here. And that's sort of the kind of challenge, which I at that time thought was pretty appropriate. I, I said, uh, OK, sir, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Open the windows all the way up. <laughs> so everybody, everybody had to sweat, including the guy who thought I was doing it wrong. My mother told me when I was growing up, because I was sassing her one time, I think I told you this story already, I told her I was going to move out, and she told me I'd come out, come in and help me to back up. So I thought, and she said she wanted, she thought I should go to law school because I always gabbed, gab, was gabbing all the time and was arguing, arguing with her about it all the time. And uh, so she thought maybe that's the way you ought to go, because you do that. I don't know whether, I don't think she really felt that, but that <laughs> was what she said. So in any event, that was something that, uh, not really the most motivating thing to cause me to want to go to college or somewhere along the line in the undergraduate work I took a lot of accounting and a lot of other uh, uh, courses to get a, a good background and along the way it, it became clear to me that I might be better as a lawyer than I would be as somebody coming out on the, into the street like that so I decided that I will try to enroll. This is while I'm still in Texas, at the University of Texas. I would decide, decided that, that I would um, go to law school. And when we were out here on vacation, uh, some friend of hers said, oh, well, you want to be a lawyer? Yeah. I said, that's good. She said, well, you ought to go to the University of Southern California. Here I was on vacation. They said, why don't you just go over there and see if, it, if you can get admitted? And I said, okay, good. And I went over there. I went down to the registrar's office on a Saturday or Sunday, uh, Saturday, and uh, found out that where I w would go to to transfer or, tr or to get it to get entries into the uh, into the law school, and so I went out and there was a, some nice young lady there, and she said, "What do you want to do here?" And I said, I, "I'm interested in attending the law school. Am I too late to to, to get into the current class?" And she said, uh, "I don't know. I don't think so." I said, "Well, here I, I give my." grade papers for all the things. Maybe you would like to look at them. And she said, yes, I would. And she goes, chow, 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 chow. she said, you're admitted. <laughs> so I thought, because the second part of that the transcript was pretty good, you know. Um, I had also written to Harvard Law School and uh, said that I'd like to uh, go there to Harvard. And I said also by a great what I greatly learned about this was, I, I said with my application, I said, uh, by the way, I'm married, I have some kids, and I'm going to have to have some outside income, and do you have some form of employment available? And I read the, received a reply from it from a, a very cold that's saying, in, our school, Harvard Law School, requires more work than any one person can do and couldn't necessarily do both go to law school and and uh, and uh, study and work and therefore we don't want we, we don't want to take you in which they did not and I worked while I was in law school one one of my jobs while in law school while I was doing in law school I was selling insurance for State Farm and I got that job because at that time State Farm was just starting the big casualty insurance business and they were hiring lots of salespeople. And so I went, went down and I got, I got that type of job. You were selling insurance by day and going to school at night or studying at night? I mean, how did you juggle both State Farm insurance and law school? Well, you said you could explain how you do it. You have to do two jobs and one of them is called going to law school. Basically, was just it. You had a job, State Farm, you had law school, and you had two to three young children. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's a lot. 
Yeah, it ruined my personality. First law firm I worked at, I worked with a firm called Gray, Binkley & Felser. I started off working with them with a very uh, beginner's job, which I think paid me uh, $300, and also uh, provided that if I were to pass the state bar, I would get a raise to $350. At the time, we thought, there was just a couple of other people hired at the same time, we thought $350 was pretty good concerning the job market. And we were pleased until we found out that we were the lowest paid people in the whole office, that secretaries were getting something like $450 a month, $500 a month. And that uh, was a little unsettling, but on the other hand, it worked out okay. How, how did you get the job? Oh, I, I just walked into somebody's office and introduced myself, basically. And what type of law firm was it? What, what type well, of the, law firm, the law firm I first approached was on one called Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, which at the time was a very large law firm. And, but uh, they were not interested in me. And, uh, but they, they said that uh, maybe I should go talk to Bill Gray. Bill Gray was at that time had a law firm of about five or six people, maybe seven or eight. And that's where I spent most of my, most of my time. We're talking now about a period back to 30, 30 years or something, because I graduated from law school in 1956. And here we're talking about, uh, well, we're talking about a long period of time back. I don't uh, have any particular um, memory because this was, this was just a general civil law practice with some litigation. Uh, I guess well, I, I guess one one thing that was uh, important is that Bob's the big boy was uh, at the at the time that I saw a drive-in restaurant. Bill Gray then had confidence to, enough in me to had to be, be the head lawyer in the firm for the Bob's big boy account, and I was, and as a result, I got to become an expert on the trademark law and. Uh, Fair, fair law and, and stuff, and, and as a result, that led me into a lot of uh, cases which I would never have got into. I got well, I had one case that I tried in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I had another case which I had to try or almost got to trial, but it settled. And Bishop, Bishop, uh, or Bismarck, uh, to South Dakota, one case someplace in Canada for some company. All of these, all of these little law related things were be at times when people, uh, guys who had a hamburger, hamburger stand, thought that the Bob's Big Boy was the best symbol there ever was in the whole world, and they would go out and, and, and say, and, and seek, tell, tell the guy to stop using him, he couldn't do it anymore. And I was then the person who wrote the letter saying, you better stop doing it because if you don't, we're going to sue you. And a lot of them ignored me, and a lot of them got sued. Because they were using the big boy. They were uh, using the big boy symbol without uh, permission of uh, Bob's big boy. And so that was a pr that was a good experience for you. That was a big experience. One of the, one of the most interesting things was that I had to go to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, because some guy in Columbia, Columbia, South Carolina, was using the Bob's big boy. And he didn't want to. He didn't want to stop, and so I had to file a law, lawsuit, and we uh, kind of had it working. It was all getting ready for trial, and and uh, this uh, there are two instances with two, two two things here. First, once I was trying a case in Columbia, South Carolina, I had to be in, in, in sworn into the state bar, and so I got that out of the done. And the guy who sponsored me. Uh, said, Your Honor, uh, this is, this lawyer here is one of our old Southern boys, Your Honor. Uh, he's out here with us to try this case, and uh, he's he's you know he's not like some of these lawyers that come from New York down here and then have, bother us all the time. And the judge says, Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm so tired of these New York lawyers. <laughs> 
And uh, I thought that was a pretty good comment. So they did, I got so I did. The case got ready for trial. The case uh, it took about six months to get the case ready for trial. And I got it ready for trial. And about that time, the, we kept the, a lot of the time in getting it ready for trial was that the judge wouldn't, wouldn't get moving on it. So we finally uh, got to the point where the, we started writing letters to the judge. And then the judge came in one morning and said, gentlemen, I've got some good news and some bad news. <clears throat> I said, what's the good news and what's the, what's the bad news? He said, well, the good news is I'm quitting this case. I'm retiring. <laughs> and the bad news, I guess, is you're going to go start over again someplace. <laughs> so, but that led immediately to the lawyers getting out in the hall and saying, well, we better stop being so hard-nosed and settle the case, which we did. The problem with the, the, problem with the case was he, he said, I'm retiring, and he said, the reason I'm doing it he said, I'm working very hard on this case, but I read all of the files and all the papers last night, and I can't tell you right now what it was that I read. And I just have no, no memory about that, and so I've got to step down, he said, which I thought was decent because a lot of people, a lot of men, some men, some judges, might not want to give up the case that really quickly. Did you like trying lawsuits in court? Did you like arguing in front of judges and juries and stuff? Yeah, that's, that's what I that's what I've been training for. Since you were a kid. <laughs> since I was a kid, since my mother sent me on the trail. No, trying a case is very very stimulating, very hard to do. It takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of time outside the office and working on it. it takes a lot of time ignoring. Your children, like people, John got ignored a lot, but <laughs> but he deserved it. And Jeff refused to be ignored. <laughs> That's right. Does uh, does trying a case in court require a little bit of acting too? Do you have to put on? Do you feel like you have to put on a performance a bit, a bit, or no? Well, you have to put on a performance, which is yourself. You can't go out and say. I'm Clark Gable, and uh, uh, look for me, or I happen to be as good as that lawyer over there, or it's the same thing. But you, you have to have your own, your own skills, your own tact, knack what you're going to do. And I found out that generally for me, uh, I don't know why it is, but generally for me, the, the longer the case was, the better it got. It might be, I'd say, a 10-day case. And at the end of the fourth day or fifth day, I was feeling not so good or about good to good about the case. And then the next next day, it all changed. It started getting better, and everybody started getting the judge started getting friendlier. The jury started looking happier. <laughs> so I figured I'll just keep going. I think probably because they got to know me better. They don't know me. Uh, at the beginning of the case, they don't know, know me very well, and I'm, they're being compared with the other lawyer in the case and so forth. But after after a certain point, uh, I always I always thought that I came across pretty honestly with the jury, and uh, I think the uh, jury would recognize that, and they did, and that's the reason they, you know, after 10 days of trial, you know a lot more about the lawyer than you did after five days. Bill Gray ultimately went to the, was elected to be state bar president. And after he spent that term for a while, he then became a United States district judge. So, so at that point, when Gray went, made, went to, the, uh, uh, dist, the, to the district court, then the rest of the firm decided that they would go someplace else. And Tom Lloyd, one of the uh, partners there, he and I left to start our own law firm called Armstrong and Lloyd. And what type of uh, uh, cases or, or clients did you have at your law firm? Anybody who wanted a lawyer and had the money. <laughs> and then we, we practiced law uh, for, for a long time. So so we had, a, there was a, in fact, two-person law firm. We had another lawyer join us and make it a three-person law firm. And then we hired a woman lawyer uh, to, to, to be a partner, and uh, we were both scared to death that all of our clients would go away if we had a woman lawyer. 
because women lawyers were not very well liked at that time. There weren't very many of them, and they were, were, weren't very popular, and uh, a lot of lawyers would not hire them. And Tom and I, Tom and I both were sort of open-minded on the question. Uh, no, we weren't. We were solidly on the question that we should have women. It wasn't anything open-minded about it. And uh, just about that time, this young lady uh, um, walked into the office looking for, looking for a job, which is the way the lawyers used to do things. They would walk over, they'd go down the, the pages and, uh, of the phone book or something and pick out what the name of someone who looked like a good lawyer. And then they go, they would go to that, approach that office. So we hired uh, uh, this, this, this woman. And that we, we thought that was that's pretty good. It turned out all right. Nobody nobody broke away. None of the clients broke away. So developing clients is in any any business unless you have somebody that's directly feeding feeding you with them is a hard job. It's just you've got to go out and work and develop and build contacts. And more importantly, you've got to be a good lawyer. I was always of the view that you should go out to have lunch with a lawyer, and uh, I think you should pick out a, a lawyer as a friend and that you haven't seen in a long time, and then you should go take that person out for a lunch. And they said, how do you know that's going to be profitable? I said, I don't know if it's going to be profitable or not, but I know who he's going to, going to send his business to the next time he has lunch, <laughs> and so, because we had bought him lunch. And so, and so that, that basically was it. And then the rest, rest of it, you just, you just d develop. I don't know how you'd, if, I, if I'd known how to really be a big, a big business cutter, I would have had a much larger firm. But I was had enough of clients that I'm, I was able to make a pretty good living. Our experience growing up with you was that uh, you worked extremely hard as a lawyer. You know, you were always out of the house. <clears throat> So before we even woke up in the morning to go to school, and you didn't get home until nine o'clock at night, and it went that way for years and years and years. Um, were all lawyers that way, or were you just exceptionally motivated, or what was the deal with you? Well, if you're uh, short of money and you need it, <laughs> you could work hard to get it. So. What, what motivated me, what mostly motivated me was doing a good job. Uh, the, and I always felt to do, do the best job was, that I could, and if it was good enough that I would get, uh, it, would, it would boost itself up. And that, that basically is what happened. But that required, uh, that required, you're, you're probably talking about times when, when I was involved in trial, and trial, it was something which required a lot of preparation and where it really required a tremendous amount of preparation is that you would have a day of trial and, and uh, you had gone into that particular day and you thought, boy, this is going to be an easy case, but it turns out, it turns out, but so at the end of the day, we were all saying, oh my God, what are we, what are we going to do? And so that required sometimes a lot of extra effort and uh, been sitting down with lawyers and partners and clients and trying to rectify what was wrong, if anything. Most of the time it was not. Most of the time it was just being nervous <laughs> about where the case was going. But that, that's essentially the, what uh, it is. Tom Lloyd got an offer from our client, uh, Dick Burns, who was in the oil business, and he wanted to, he wanted to retain um, Tom Lloyd as his lawyer, which I said, okay, that's very good. And what am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is go find another law firm to join. And that, that's how I lost, uh, that's how I found McDonnell, Halstead, and Laybourne. McDonnell, uh, Halstead, and Laybourne uh, were, was a small uh, business-oriented or firm with a little bit of society accent mixed in with it. And they're very nice people. In any event, that firm merged with Baker and McKenzie. And Baker and McKenzie at the time was something like uh, 2,000 lawyers throughout the United States. 
And I used to have uh, friends, that, or I had friends who would say to me, tell me how you, how you go from a partner, an important partner, in a two-person law firm, and the next day we heard, you're a partner in a thousand-person law firm. How do you do that? I said, charm. <laughs> I was head of the litigation for the Los Angeles office of Baker and McKenzie. Was that a good experience? I, I guess so. It, uh, it's been a long time ago, and the more lawyers you get together, the more um, more sharing of of uh, problems. Bill Gray has, was president of the L.A. County Bar Association, and he was president of the state bar. And I, I sort of followed in his tracks with the state bar, and I got appointed to the uh, to the state bar. His career inspired my career, actually. You have to run for election uh, <clears throat> with the lawyers group, and, and you, the state bar members of the state bar are lawyers, and they they would uh, they voted me, voted me in to, to being president. I think I was working for McDonnell Halstead. They thought that was a very important position to hold, and important for both for both me and for the uh, firm. And so that's how I that, that they had no there's no conflict there. I, I had to bill about the same amount uh, as, a, as president of the bar as I was billing it uh, you know, out of practicing the law at the time. So it was a took a lot took a lot of effort on my part, but that, that's that's paid off. Oh, I, I can't. I, there's an awful lot went on in the state bar, which would take the rest of the rest of the time to discuss, but it's not, it's not particularly important because nothing, no, nobody was assassinated or nobody was thrown out of the office, nobody was impeached. Uh, you know, it really sounds like a pretty dull activity. It was pretty dull activity. But uh, there were a lot of very important things we did too, but I, I think they were beyond perhaps, beyond this center. Why did I want to become a judge? It was a prestigious job. I thought I'd be good at it, and it'd be very enjoyable, I thought. And it'd be doing a great, I'd hoped. And people would say I did a great public service by serving as a judge. So. That's, that's never, I've never been able to come up with a satisfactory answer to that. I'm smarter than the other guys, don't you understand? That's why I want to become a judge. I've looked over the crop of people who want to be out there. They're, oh, I'm the number one of the whole crop. So why shouldn't I say, okay, give me the whole job? I don't think I'd look so good. I had practiced law and lived to practice in the law, which meant that a judge could trust me if I fever was appointed. That I, I wouldn't be some nut who wanted to go out and burn the flags, uh, because if I'd had that sort of published in my lifetime, I ain't going anywhere in the judiciary. They don't want that kind of person in there. They want people that can, they can trust. That's all. I had an application out for for appointment as a justice of the state of California. At the time, uh, it was getting very late in the day because there wasn't much time left for the, the governor to choose the, for appointment. And I had at the time a friend named Fred uh, Flanagan. And Mr. Flanagan knew the governor, our good new governor, Duke Majin. And one of the one of the moving partners, things, one of the moving things to the governor was that the governor knew Mr. Flanagan, Flanagan really quite well and relied upon Mr. Flanagan for a lot of appointments. And Mr. F Mr. Flanagan was also at the time the appointment secretary for the state bar. So I knew Mr. Flanagan really well. One night when we were sitting around the house, Mary Dean and I, down at the desert, by the way, uh, we got a phone call, a long distance phone call. And the phone call was from Flanagan, who was speaking for, for Duke Major. And uh, uh, Mary Dean and, and Mr. Flanagan we're having a long, long, long conversation with a lot of laughter and a lot of joking and a lot of carrying on. And so that led me to sit there. I was listening to it, and no, nobody was paying any attention to me. This is the kind of conversation that 
Somebody says, I know I've got to, t I know I've got to tell a person. I know it's going to be hurtful to him. I know it's going to be bad to him. I know I'm going to walk away without a friend, maybe, and so forth and so on. I said, that's probably what, what Flanagan was trying to cover, do was cover his track. I will to talk to Mary Jane. Yeah, I will tell her what a nice guy is. And I'm telling her this, I'm doing so forth and so on. And then I, I, when they hung up, I said, oh boy, here comes the bad news. And instead it was, it was the good news. Flanagan turned to me and said, oh, by the way, the governor is appointing you to the Superior Court tomorrow. Thank you very much, and I do a good job. <laughs> that was it for that appointment. To me, that's the inside story of how you become a judge. That's the way it is. That's about the same way it is on the Court of Appeal. I knew John Argue very well. John Argue was a prominent lawyer, very important Republican, Republican lawyer. And he said one time, you know, maybe you ought to get on the Court of Appeal. That would be a good job. I said, yeah, I would, but who's going who's to put me, a Democrat, uh, onto the Court of Appeal? He said, oh, well, leave it to me. Well, politics is a strange, strange animal. Governors like to appoint people that uh, of, of the other party sometimes when they are pretty sure what that other, what that other party might truly think about the, the world and what happens on in the profit. Everybody who was aware of the appointment knew that I was a Democrat, and they all expressed the, the, the same feeling. Well, the governor had to appoint one, one Democrat, and they got Armstrong for the two, two jobs. That's all it amounts to. They got me, they got me because they, they, they would appoint me as, even though I'm a Democrat, they would appoint me, appoint, appoint me because they knew they would not be ashamed of a, by appointing a Democrat. That's all. Because it sounded like you weren't going to let politics affect your decision making when you were in the courts. You were a straight shooter and you weren't going to let that affect you. Yeah, they, could, they might say that. They said, sure, that I would not be uh, uh, treating it as a political office. But I don't know all those things. I'm just telling you what the broad overview of how, how you become a judge. And I become a judge because I knew two, two people, Flanagan and Argue. And both of them spoke very, very highly of me. Both of them liked me really quite a well, and both of them were willing to put their neck on the line with the governors. That's what they did. That's all. That's a pretty simple story. Let's talk about what it was like being a Superior Court judge. You dealt with kids. Was that a big change for you? Was it what? Was that a big change for you, uh, having to deal with child, children's crimes? Juvenile court? Yes, of course it's a big difference for me. I, I go into Superior Court and I'm assigned it to, to a department which deals with um, uh, delinquent children, minors, and so forth. And I, I, I got interested, or I, when I was there, got appointed, after I'd been there for a while, I began to understand and sympathize, emphasize, or uh, sometimes, with the trouble that these uh, minor children would find themselves in. And, you know, some kid says, I don't like him, I'm going to shoot him. Bang, bang, bang. And that, that's something no, I had no, ever had any experience with doing that. So I was there and I began to learn all of that sort of stuff. I had to try these cases and sometimes I had to send all kids off to prison for a long time or send them to, to court camp also. But I did, the, the politics wasn't involved in any of that. And that's what the governors wanted. In, in the Superior Court judge. Politics are not involved in being a, a, a judge. Not involved from the point of view of my going out and... I, I never even spoke to the governor except that one time. And neither one of the governors. Shows you what power I had by the governor. <laughs> so you've been a lawyer. You've been trying cases in court, civil issues. And all of a sudden you're being thrown into being a judge. Is there a learning curve? Well, especially a learning curve if you're thrown into being a judge in, in, a, in a delinquency court because that's where you're meeting a lot of people that you've never met before in your whole life who are there for being tried. So, yeah, that, that takes a lot of uh, effort on your part to do that. Did you ever think, like, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? I should go back to being a lawyer? Or did you, once no. you became a judge, was it just never look back? Never look back. I like the job. The job is very good, I thought, you know. 
is it a nice place to be there? Is deal live with nice people most of the time? Deal dealt with the lawyers and other judges, which is a good thing to do. And uh, sometimes you have to do something. Sometimes you have to send the kid off for a long time because the law requires it. And you say, but I just shouldn't have to do this because I don't think this kid is this guilty. But he's going to do it anyway because that's what the law says. Yeah, so but one, going from, going from a, a civil practice where I'm dealing all the time with people who are essentially are uh, law keepers, not law breakers, then I got involved in a, in a court which was mostly with law breakers. In, in a sense, it, is, it was emotional, uh, only because I knew in my heart sometimes that, that one kid gets off with it while another kid doesn't get off with it. And sometimes maybe you don't get the right kids in the right positions, and uh, that's that sort of thing. But uh, I put it this way. All the time I was on a, on a juvenile court, I don't think I made any decision, any wrong decision with sentencing any of the guys, the people who came before me. I mean, I might differ with the kids, or I might send him off to camp, or I might do something else. But emotion had nothing to do with it, and other than the fact that you're a bad guy, that, that I found you to be a bad guy, and I'm going to send it your way. You understand that? Yeah. yeah. So judges are not supposed to have any emotions, you know. But to this particular, this particular case, type of case, it's very, very difficult. Well, it's like any judge has got a civil case has got difficult cases, but th this is a life and sort of life and prison case that, that uh, uh, gang members are, you know, very funny people. I always tell everybody that the gang gang members are bad bad people, and I think what we should do, however, is take a gang gang members and take them all to a driving range and teach them how to shoot a rifle. And people say, why would they do that? I said, well, I just read in the paper yesterday that a, that a gang member shot two blocks away a baby child who was in a nurse, nurse carriage. I said, if he had hey, taken my, my, my lesson and learned to use a gun, he would hit what he was shooting. He wasn't shooting at this kid. He was shooting at somebody else. Did you ever uh, worry with some of your decisions and fear for yourself dealing with these types of gangs that... No, I'll tell you, tell you one, I, you're never even exposed to that on the Court of Appeal. Nobody, the, the, the type of lawyer who comes before the Court of Appeal and the kind of type of parties, very seldom would, they, they might walk out to the bar and say, the guy's really bad, the judge's really bad, but they, they wouldn't take you anything to hurt me. I learned that from the Court of Appeal. On the other hand, I had a delinquency case where uh, the, uh, which is a very difficult case where a young man got uh, his father's pistol and was playing around with it with another friend and he was playing Russian roulette and he put the gun up to his head, you know, and it clicked to click it and it didn't go off and he gave it to the other kid and he went click, click, bang, I'm dead. So what do you do in a case like that? I mean, this is a, a kid comes from a good family, he's a decent fit, he was, not, this is his first criminal offense, he was a member playing in a game, uh, he was not out to kill anybody, but he did, and so you've got to probably punish him, man. that's all there is to it. And so, you, it, but then where you, you get an out, you get the question, of how much punishment do I, do I give him? And in this case, we were concerned about whether or not this, this child needed some uh, helpful uh, psychiatric help, maybe, to work with it, to do what had happened to him. And so uh, what I was going to do is appoint him to, to a, a recovery system, which was going to be take a while, to, to like 20 days or something. And what, what happened, then somebody, somebody, some stranger, uh, or somebody told one of my clerks, they said, better tell the judge that there's some people that some people was being the father of this, per of this person who did the shooting, who says that, that the judge judge is wrong, and I'm going to make it right. I'm going to blow up his car or shoot him or something. So I knew he wasn't going to do that. But on the other hand, what the Delhi County does, 
I notify them about that, and they send send somebody into the courtroom, and they send somebody out to interview the kid, and they start chart checking with other people about it, and uh, so you get it. You don't have experiences like that, but both both involving someone so young, and then someone someone threatening to do it, to to shoot, to cause you harm at the same time. So that's that's the about the the, the hardest type of decision that you can be called upon to make, really. So I was going to send the kid away, and I was clear, and the father father made it clear that he didn't like it, and so anyway, to finish up on the story, they. At the pre-hearing or whatever the hearing was, the father was set to would, would come there, and he was a very uh, high-tempered type of person, and I, we all knew something was going to happen here in the courtroom. And so, the testimony was going on, and uh, the courtroom has uh, had the doors to the back and doors doors to the front, and one of the doors to the back opened and then hit. <laughs> And to walk to the Highway Patrol, a deputy sheriff, great big mean-looking guy, and uh, the sheriff came in, stood up, and then after a few more lines of testimony, a door, another door opens down on the other side of the courtroom, and in comes a big sheriff, and then pretty soon there's another door opening to enter again to the court, and then here's another deputy sheriff coming. So by the time we got to, to, to the deputy sheriff, there had been four or five deputies. You're standing out there to protect me. You know, it's pretty, pretty interesting. And it was, it was the way they did it, it was so carefully done that no one but me knew that there's, these deputies had some excuse to being there. So I don't know where that fits into the story, but that that is kind of that's what. That's what you talk about emotional cases, John. That's that's one of the emotional cases. Yeah, that sounds pretty intense. And so, um, did the father react? Uh, no, on this this day, the, somebody had talked to the father, I guess, and he was very calm and he listened to it very quietly. But then the deputy sheriff, one of the, the head deputies, uh, okay, said to me that what I should do every, every time I left the courtroom, look underneath the car. Make sure there's no package underneath the car, <laughs> you know, because maybe somebody's going to stick a bomb in there. So, so that's that is a little different practice that I had as a in the civil law, but it's a very very worthwhile practice, and I learned a great deal about human beings and and why they do things and why what we try to apply some acts which we could make them expect. Get them out of the community if that's necessary, and if not, uh, uh, punish them properly. So, I had some friends at the time who uh, always liked to play jokes on people. Like they'd call up someone and say, "Oh, this." They call my secretary and they say, "My secretary say, who's calling, please?" And then that person would say, "Oh, this is uh, Arnold Palmer. I just call up to the judge to see if he'd like a golf game." And then at one time, the uh, uh, my my clerk came into the, my office and said, almost for a judge, I don't know whether this call is from one jerk, one of one of your strange friends or not, but there is somebody on my line who says he's Governor Wilson, and he wants to appoint you to Supreme Court to the Court of Appeal. Will you take it? And so then she went back on the line and. Hi, Mr. Armstrong. This is Governor Wilson. I'd like to point you to the uh, to the to the Court of Appeal. Would you be willing to take that job? Oh, absolutely. Go. Thank you very much. Goodbye. That was it. You believed him, though. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I knew he wasn't Arnold Palmer. <laughs> now that's that's the real story. But you know, I mean, that's that's rather than being this this. Thoughtful sort of thing. Why did you take the job? Well, I took the job. What's the ob What's the obvious answer to that? You're gonna take the job. Why are you gonna take the? I'm gonna take the job because this guy would appoint me. Did you have satisfying years on the Court of Appeal? Were you were you very pleased to be on there for as many years as you were? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
being on the Court of Appeal, you have interesting work to do. You've got a lot of lawyers working for you. You've got a lot of consulting with other other judges to see what what the cases will be like. It's just a very satisfying judge. You have a lot of responsibility. You have uh, a different type of responsibility as an appellate, appellate court justice as you do as a trial court judge. It's just a different job, different concerns, different ways to handle it, and so forth. But the Court of Appeal decision is the final decision, unless somebody files a notice of appeal with the uh, Supreme Court. And did you um, ever aspire to be on the Supreme Court? Was that something that you... Yes, <clears throat> yes, I did. Uh, that's that's the peak, peak of your career to be on the Supreme Court, uh, the California Supreme Court. Of course, to be on the U.S. Supreme Court, that's really the peak of your career. But uh, yes, I did. Of course, you talked it over with some friends and so forth. And I had, uh, in, in this case, the case I had, uh, uh, old Wilson made the appointment, uh, too. He had appointed me to the Court of Appeal, and then there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court, California Supreme Court. And he appointed that person. But before appointed, I had a, a letter from a friend of mine that, that said, sent me a copy of a letter. He said, Dear Judge, here's a copy of the, here's a copy of the letter I sent to the to the to, to the uh, governor uh, recommending you to be on the Court of Appeal and that you're the best qualified person I've ever known and so forth, etc. And he got a response back from the governor that said, I "Is this very? I, I, I got your letter. Uh, he's a very be a very good appointment. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for him, but he's too old." Because that's a that's a 15-year term or something like that. The governor wants whoever to put us those jobs. Not, you know you're going to be on the side of the governor. So, who was your biggest fan in your in supporting you and encouraging you in your law career? Mary Dean. My big biggest fan. Yeah. Yeah. She wanted me to succeed as well as I wanted to succeed. So. Well, she was always so proud of you. You know, she has she had scrapbooks she used to show me, pictures of you throughout your career, you know, and she seemed to be very supportive and very proud. Well, it's a mutual admiration society, I'll tell you that. How do you want people to uh, uh, remember your career um, as a judge? I mean, what do you want people to remember about you? I think uh, being a, a reasonable, reasonable person, and trying hard to, hard to, to do justice. Uh, that's what you would want people to think about you, I think. Something very laudatory about the greatest judge that ever took the bench and so forth. But th those, those kind of judges are very rare in individuals because they get a lot more publicity than I'd ever get. Do you have any advice for uh, judges, for new judges? <laughs> well, for the, uh, just to volunteer to go to the juvenile court and the delinquency court, and lo and behold, on you, during your career, you become a justice of the Court of Appeal. Thank you very much. <laughs>